Welcome to Basic Brewing Radio for Thursday, June 28th, 2007. I'm James Spencer. Here at Basic Brewing Radio, we're all about home brewing. Well, this week we take you to Denver, Colorado for the keynote address of the National Home Brewers Conference delivered by Peter Buchart, brewmaster of New Belgium Brewery. Well, if you're new to home brewing or would like to get into the hobby for the first time, check out our website, basicbrewing.com, where you can find archives of our audio and video podcasts and our DVDs to walk you through basic and more advanced brewing techniques. Well, we're back from our little June break, even though June isn't officially over. Uh, You know, with family vacations and covering the NHC in Denver, it was going to be pretty much impossible to do a good job of keeping up with the podcast this past month. So I felt it would be better just to have a little hiatus and uh, come back refreshed and with lots of stuff to uh, carry us through the rest of the summer. And we've done that. We've got a ton of uh, good stuff on the schedule for you. And uh, we appreciate your patience and the emails while we were out, and, and it's good to be good to be missed, but it's good to be back too. Um, I want to say hello again to everybody that we met out in Colorado in person. It's always excellent, great to talk to listeners in person, and there were many more of you this year than there were last year in Orlando. Uh, last year we got you know recognized by like five folks down there, you know, and it was nice to to shake hands with people and. This year it was like every time we walked down the hallway or in an elevator or something, hey, you know, Basic Brewing guys, Stephen James, you know, Andy, hey, guys, you know. So we were blown away by the number of, of uh, people who, uh, you know, we, we met and uh, shook our hands and said thank you for the, the podcast and stuff. And and uh, some even said that it was, it was watching and listening to us that got them in the brewing to begin with. So that's even more rewarding. So anyway, appreciate you guys. Uh, coming up and saying howdy, and and uh, it was a blast to be out there uh, to see you face to face. I also want to thank uh, Steve Wilkes and Andy Sparks for uh, attending the conference, as well as uh, and uh, representing the Basic Brewing team out there in uh, Denver. And thanks to Sherry Sparks for uh, coming out as well and and sharing her husband's time with us. And uh, I have a, a funny story to tell, or at least I thought it was funny. When uh, Steve and I arrived at the conference hotel, the uh, elevator was broken. It was out. So we had to go from the fourth floor where the lobby was down to the second floor where our rooms were. So we we dragged our luggage through the stairwell, which was uh, around through part of the kitchen and other places, you know, kind of uh, in the in the back of the building there. And we got a little lost. So uh, I started saying, hello, Cleveland, Uh, just like in the movie This is Spinal Tap, where they got lost backstage and were shouting around saying, hello, Cleveland. And um, uh, Steve didn't get the joke. And unfortunately, neither did anyone else that we passed uh, as we were walking through the bowels of the building or in the hallways or anything like that as I kept shouting, hello, Cleveland. And... um, so I, on club night, I was talking to a doc from the Brewing Network, and I told him about getting lost in the stairwell, and he said, just like Spinal Tap. So there you go. There, <laughs> Finally, somebody uh, got the joke. So a big, big hello, Cleveland, to Doc from the Brewing Network, and um, I guess it proves that we're both old. Uh, <laughs> to see what, uh, see what I'm talking about, go to uh, YouTube and type in hello, Cleveland, and you can see the clip. I love Spinal Tap. But, you know, then again, I'm, I'm, I'm old. Uh, speaking of other podcasters, we also got to spend some uh, good quality time with uh, Rick Hagerbomber from uh, Big Foamy Head. Uh, we got to eat dinner with him and, and drink some beers with him. And, and uh, it was good to see Rick in person. Never saw him and uh, never seen him in person. We talked to him on the, on the, um, uh, over the, what is it, what, Skype, I guess we used for the, uh, for our little um, interactions and such as that, and email back and forth over the years. But uh, it was good to see Rick in person. He's actually moving from Memphis to Denver, so I guess he's going to go to GABF this year uh, as a given. Uh, and before I forget, also be sure to check out our gallery page on basicbrewing.com. Mark and Tim from Ashburn, Virginia, went to the Nepalese Himalaya, mountains and climbed Mount Kalapatar, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, which is just over 18,000 feet tall. 
and features a great view of Mount Everest, by the way. And, uh, well, if you're home brewers uh, and you're in, you know, in the Nepalese Himalaya and you're, you've climbed 18,000 feet, what else would you do at that point but break out some home brew made by your buddy Jeffrey from Leesburg, Virginia, and, of course, open your parkas to show off your basic brewing T-shirts for the camera. <laughs> That's right. On our gallery page, you can see Mark and Tim with their basic brewing shirts, with Everest in the background, and they're holding home brews. So, there you go. On a serious note, Tim says, drinking alcohol, even in moderation at high altitudes, may increase the susceptibility to altitude sickness. He says the bottle shown in the picture was not completely consumed at the time of the photo. Some of it was offered as a sacrifice to the mountain gods, he says. And uh, by the way, Steve and I found out about altitude and alcohol while we were in the uh, Mile High City and uh, Boulder and such. Uh, took us a couple days to hit our stride out there. So anyway, thanks to uh, Mark and Tim for that uh, great picture. Also in the gallery is Jason from Kentucky on Highway 129 somewhere in uh, East Tennessee or Western North Carolina. I'm not sure which. And uh, Jason says that part of uh, Highway 129 is known as the Tail of the Dragon. And uh, there are very pretty mountains there behind Jason as well, as he's wearing his uh, basic brewing T-shirt and standing next to his Mini Cooper. Uh, Jason and his wife were uh, taking part in a Mini Cooper gathering and uh, he says they, there was a beer swap as a part of the uh, get-together as well. So thank you, Jason, for that. Not to diminish, you know, the mountains that you stood in front of were uh, a little shorter than the ones that Mark and Tim were in front of. But uh, <laughs> but that doesn't mean that I appreciate your picture any, any, any less. Uh, thank you very much. And you can also uh, see a picture of some uh, goober hunting shells on a beach in Florida while wearing a basic brewing shirt. So... <clears throat> anyway, thanks to everybody who's uh, sending photos for the shirt gallery. And, uh, you know, it's going to be tough to top the Everest photo, but I know it can be done. Uh, very soon I'm going to post photos from uh, the NHC, the National Homebrewers Conference, on the site, like a gallery from there, some pictures that we took uh, while we were there. We also went up to a boulder and uh, went to Redstone Meadery, uh, Avery, and we went up to... Um, Port Collins, we went to uh, New Belgium, and uh, oh gosh, I'm going to leave s some people out uh, down to Lions that did Oscar Blues, uh, Longmont that did Left Hand, um, Aurora did Dry Dock there. Ah, I know I'm going to leave somebody out. Oh, uh, Windcoop in um, in the Denver area as well. So, you know, we got to taste a lot of good beers and, and visit some some cool. Uh, breweries and and uh, so check out the uh, description of this episode on basicbrewingradio.com for the link to uh, the gallery page of all the, the photos. And now I'm uh, it's been a while since I've done this, so uh, you know I'm, I'm probably droning on a lot longer than I should here. But uh, let's look in the mailbag here quickly. John from a Adelaide in uh, Australia sent me a link to a handy thermometer chart that will help me uh, convert temperatures to and from Celsius while I'm uh, interviewing folks, uh, kind of on the fly. I appreciate that, John. And it's printed out and pinned to the wall of the recording studio. I'm looking at it right now. And, uh, you know, hopefully I can read it when we're uh, talking about uh, temperature. So I don't have an excuse as long as I'm in the studio anymore. Thanks, John. You may remember a few weeks back that we had a, a question about cooling wort using dry ice. Well, Fred in Apex, North Carolina, did some figuring and estimated it would take almost 40 pounds of dry ice to cool a, a wort in a steel kettle from boiling to uh, 67 degrees Fahrenheit, or 19.4 degrees Celsius. So uh, there you go, about 40 pounds of dry ice to chill down your average gravity wort. Thanks, Fred. It's, I'd still like to see how that would work in, in real life. It sounds like fun. Uh, I've had a, a bunch of good feedback on the article I wrote in uh, Brew Your Own Magazine on brewing with small batches. And uh, one of the home brewers I quoted in the story was Brett Nyland from Tulsa. And uh, Brett has some more thoughts on small batches. Brett says, you mentioned losing a good deal of wort to testing. I agree that a refractometer is the perfect choice for the wort side, 
For specific gravity readings on the beer side, I usually try to hedge my bets. Obviously, it's a bad idea to return a sample to the carboy, and the refractometer is now useless due to alcohol in the beer. If you really want that pre-bottling reading, I suggest returning the sample to one of the bottles. Brent says, I use an easily recognized clear glass bottle to become the victim. I return the sample that gave me the final reading from my sanitized thief to this bottle along with enough beer to top it up. This way, I have a test bottle to open first, a nice way to see how the settling is going, and to monitor chill haze when the time comes. As a plus, if the test bottle is off, Brett says it hasn't happened yet, I know I didn't rule, uh, ruin the whole batch. That's good, Brent. Uh, I always, I can't help myself, I always drink the uh, hydrometer sample. <laughs> i got to taste it. Part of, part of the science. Uh, Brett also says, I recommend a, a more accurate scale, especially for small grain, all small scale, all grain brewers. The ability to duplicate a recipe is severely hampered by a gram scale. I suggest a scale capable of reading tenths of grams. I got one on the internet for around 30 bucks that reads in tenths and has a capacity of two kilos or 4.4 pounds. I know it may seem like overkill, Brett says, but half a gram difference with high alpha hops in only one gallon over a 60-minute boil can push you quite outside the style guidelines and be rather detectable, especially in a lightly hopped beer. So once again, good advice. Brett, I appreciate uh, that, and thanks again for help with the uh, BYO article. Uh, A couple days ago, I personally broke in my new two-gallon drinking water cooler mash tun uh, with an all-grain six-pack Simcoe ale brew. It only took me a little over three hours from start to finish, uh, and it was fun, too. I can't wait to play with uh, exotic ingredients on that small scale with the all-grain brewing. Okay, on to our uh, feature for today. Peter Buchart, brewmaster for New Belgium, is sometimes a controversial figure. He and Charlie Papazian have been known to go head-to-head on the issue of beer styles. Charlie is a leader in defining styles that beers are judged by, and Peter thinks styles cramp creativity. You've heard him say so on this podcast, in fact. So, uh, Peter took advantage of the opportunity of the keynote address at the National Homebrewers Conference to uh, poke at Papazian a bit more on the subject of styles. And uh, now I have to apologize for the quality of of this recording, and while the, while the content is good, the the quality of the recording itself is uh, not up to my standards. Uh, I don't know what went wrong. I tested the equipment beforehand, but you know sometimes electronics can uh, let you down, even though you think they're uh, up to snuff. So I hope you'll bear with a bit of distortion to uh, hear what Peter says. Now the first voice you'll hear is that of Charlie Papazian. I've known Peter for quite a while, and and I've had the rare pleasure to sit down and talk to him about brewing every once in a while. One of the one of the things I'll always remember when we were talking about brewing beer and formulating beer is uh, uh, Peter's approach to trying to zero in on a uh, formulation of beer, and 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 what he said really stuck to me. He says, when you have a target. And what you're shooting for is in the middle of that target. The way to achieve the bullseye is to learn everything and brew everything that's around the target. So you know your environment. You know all about the directions your different ingredients and processes can go. And then when you try all these things that are totally around and about what you're really going after, then you can accurately achieve what your really aim is. So that always stuck with me. Peter's uh, a great brewer, a great brewmaster, all of you know who ever tried New Belgian beers, they have a tremendous variety. Peter and I go way back, like, like I just said, and we go back and forth, we have discussions on the value of beer styles. <laughs> and the funny thing is, I think, most of the time we pretty much agree on things. Sometimes. Sometimes. Well, <laughs> today is Peter's turn. So help, help me welcome Peter Bukhar. Thanks. <laughs> okay, 
Um, I decided to start my talk with um, how I started in brewing. And um, I want to do that, and I'm going to try to reflect also on, uh, by doing so on how I think the future looks for brewing in the U.S., um, making some reflections from that. I will definitely pick on Charlie, I promise that. Um, <laughs> but I'll do that a little bit later in your talk, so you still relax for the moment, but um, I'm coming back. So, um, where should I start? Yeah, um, I'm a little bit uh, an anomaly, I think, for home brewers as such, because although I started with beer drinking, um, as you guys all did, I would guess, but then I never did a home brew. I went to brewing school, and I started um, learning how to brew in brewing school without ever having... I worked a little bit in distilling, so I had done some mashing and some distilling and such, but never really had uh, focused on brewing at all. I went to brewing school. And that was interesting, brewing school. I really learned there that there's one ingredient that is very important in brewing, or at that point maybe I thought it was the only ingredient, and that was knowledge. And if you go to a European brewing school, you basically know how to make a good beer, um, you don't know how to make a great beer, though, but uh, you at least have this one leg. And from there, uh, Gary, if you want to switch a slide, uh, I went on to Zolte. Um, this is actually not a picture from Zolte, but who knows, eh? Um, <laughs> Zolte was a very interesting brewery, very beautiful brewery, um, very well equipped. We made um, a kind of a golden strong, Judas. We made Zolte, who was a sour beer. We made a kind of a fortified Pilsner, the 1664 from Kronenburg. And we made four different kinds of table beers, the beer for kids in Belgium. And so it was really a fun time for me there as uh, just coming from brewing school to play around and make all those kinds of things in a very well-equipped brewery. But after that, I moved on to Rodema, and that's actually a picture from Rodema. Rodema then was a pretty interesting brewery as such because what you're supposed to see on this slide here is some of the oaken barrels. And um, we were aging all the beer for around two years on oak. Um, it's quite different. Me, as a young brewing engineer, I thought I knew how to make beer, but then you come in a place like that. Um, and so one of the first projects I got um, there was... was um, they, were, they just had a good year, and they did some capex expenditure, and they had put some cylinder conical tanks in, and then had never used it. And they're like, oh, now we hired a young guy. Let's put him in charge there. And he's going to change from flat bottom tanks, as you see there in the left upper corner. My left and right are sometimes on the wrong side, so just... Uh, and then uh, they had bought those cylinder conicals on the right. Um, and they're like, okay, you switch this. You switch that fermentation into cylinder conical tanks. That was kind of a huge, interesting project for me as such. Um, because... I really started to learn that, that brewing is not only about, okay, there's more ingredients to brewing than knowledge. And the ingredient that I did, wow, we did a whole light show here. <laughs> I planned for that. Eh? Um, where was I? Um, ingredients, yeah, the ingredients. Thanks. Um, but uh, besides knowledge, that there was also experience as a, uh, um, an ingredient in brewing. And to me, it was very fun to go through that because a lot of breweries had switched from those type of fermentations into cylinder conical, and there was a lot of knowledge available. I, I could tap in universities on doing so, but nobody had done it in a mixed fermentation from uh, where you have yeast and lactobacilli together and where you need to try to reproduce the same beer in a whole different environment. That was really a very fun time for me. It took me actually years because I only could do roughly one test um, every two weeks, uh, just because I had a test fermenter that was specially equipped to um, take samples on six different levels, and really those lactobacillus were behaving pretty weird, so I needed to take samples at six different levels. Okay, so I was a lot smarter after that, knew, knowing that there was a second ingredient to brewing. Wow. Um, Rodema, I spent there 10 years of my life, so um, there were a few other things that I saw while being there. One was that um, I saw a lot of um, foreigners visiting the breweries, um, Japanese and Americans. And it was fun for me, uh, the first years that I was working there, that uh, if you gave them a Rodema Grand Cru, you always had them pulling funny faces because of the sourness. They weren't used to it. And as years went on, 
people really started to know this beer because I was waiting on the funny face and there was no funny face coming. <laughs> Those people really started to know something about And for me, that was the first indication that there was something happening in the U.S. on the beer side. Because if you live in Belgium, you think, oh, U.S., it's Budweiser uh, yeah. and anything else. And um, also some home brewers, um, a home brewer and a brewer, actually, they brought in Sierra Nevada Bigfoot. And I still hate this beer up to this day. <laughs> but to me, it was again an indication. So, wow, this is a brewery who's selling this? And so it was for me really a first bell who made or showed me that there was something happening in the U.S. who kind of made it interesting for me to check it out here. But okay, I had some other things in Roma. What else did I need to tell? It's on my paper day. Can you say it? No. <laughs> you probably can't read it. <laughs> um, yeah, and then um, we, Rodenbach bought another brewery, if you go to the next slide, and that was uh, the Houden Boom in Brugge. And that was a fun time for me also in the sense that that was back to knowledge really, but then it was the first expanding brewery that I was working in. And the Houden Boom is in a medieval city being Brugge, and any expansion that we had to do there, putting cylindro conicals in, it was a nightmare. It was really so much fun for me what I could do there um, on different levels. So for me, it was really a revival of my brewing um, knowledge as such and how I could apply it. Uh, unfortunately, this brewery is now close to that location. The beer is are still existing. But you see uh, Paul van Esten, the tallest brewer in Belgium, and then uh, Wem, who was his brewmaster. Uh, next slide. And from there on, uh, the, my last years in Rodenbach, I started the brew pub. <laughs> I'm going to have you. I'm going to learn that. Um, I started the brew pub. No, I didn't really start a brew pub. I started home brewing for the first time. And that was, for me, a pretty interesting experience because since we had this, they commissioned quite a bit of equipment in uh, Rodenbach, uh, but moving to the cylinder conical vessels, I still had a whole bunch of vessels where we used to collect our yeast in. And those were pretty wide but not very tall and those were very good for home brewing and so I got, took those home and started home brewing with a friend and we made a beer um, a sour beer because we used a little bit of the it's kind of uh, what Bob made here um, is quite similar it was lower in alcohol a bit higher in uh, acid, uh, lactic acid um, and a bit more aromatic in the nose, I would say, as the differences. But that was a beer on the right side here. So this is the right side for me. Um, the, and the Hackenier, the beer next to it, was actually a fun one, the way we created that one. Um, we started brewing. We did a mash. Um, we were working during the mash on trying to create a lot. It was, um, it was home brewing, but it was full grain. Uh, we didn't know about anything else than that. Stupid brewers that we were. Um, so while we were mashing, we made a lot of time. We were drilling holes and then put a, a tablecloth in it. And we lottered in that. We started boiling and we were like, how, how are we going to cool our wort here when that's done? And um, it took us a while to make our cooling system and to experiment with it and then to um, finally get it sanitized before we were going to send the wort to. I was sending our wort through it and it comes out brown. It was completely pale malt. But it had boiled for three, four hours, I don't know. <laughs> so that's how we had the second beer, a Hackenier, um, a very uneconomical uh, If you look through the CO2 uh, output that we had on that beer, it was pretty bad, but okay. <laughs> a fun part about this is uh, we got a prize for our label before we grew up to grow, uh, group up. Uh, at the home brewers level, we were already bottling in those bottles, and we had a friend in the bar was like, oh, I want to make a label, and he made this label, who was very difficult to apply, but okay, and we got a price for our um, label before we started to brew up. We bought some equipment from another uh, small brewery, the B, Brewery, the B is still around, um, and then while we were buying equipment, talking to an equipment sales guy, he's like, what are you guys going to do? And we're like, oh, we're scaling up our home brewing to 500 liters, we want to do a little bit more than that. He's like, where are you going to do that? Like our oh, neighbors, uh, well, my friend had a shed in his um, in the back of his garden, and that was where we were doing a brewery. He's like, I do have a location for you guys. Like, okay, and he showed us the location. the The floor was wooden, completely wood, but it was from 
large upstanding oaken footers that had contained beer. There were a few water bottoms in there. The bar that he had was actually a kettle. It was like suddenly we were thrown in as being a brew pub here where we were still kind of like, okay, let's make some beer and see what we can do with that. <laughs> so, but what I learned uh, really was that there's a third ingredient to brewing. I already, I already knew about, um, what the heck was it again? Knowledge, um, experience, but that there was creativity. You really could make whatever you want. Huh? Stupid me, I wasn't a home brewer. Huh? I had to discover that in the third, as the third ingredient as such. So that's, um, uh, at that point, uh, I met Kim and Jeff at one of the craft brewers conferences in um, 1996, and I moved to New Belgium, and that's the next slide. That was where I was confronted with the end product from Charlie Papagian. Styles. <laughs> People were, the first question they ask is, what style is it? And coming from Belgium, that's kind of like a question, like, what style? You know, I make beer, but style, I don't know really what it is. Um, or I say now from 1554 that it's an authentic 15th century black beer from Brussels. Who knows? Um, <laughs> Charlie still hasn't created the style around that, but he will, <laughs> under my pressure. Um, if you go to Belgium, you go to a bar, even a good bar, a special beer bar, you find the menu, the beer list, and what do you see? Pale, amber, dark. I was in Brasbeert last week, and they have 300 different beers. Oh, too late here. <laughs> 300 different beers. And there it's split up by province and by brewery. Or maybe sometimes they split up by location in the sense of Lambic Brewery or Trappist Brewery. But that's where I came from. And then you come here and people are like, what style is this? And I'm like, oh, wow, style. It's fat eye, you know. Um, <laughs> And I had a big <laughs> style running, actually, with my house, if you want to switch slides. Those are my two sons, uh, Wout and Jo. And as you can see from the picture, the one um, likes blue and the other one likes green. <laughs> and so, um, although we are in Colorado, but our garden is pretty green. It's a mature garden. Um, it's pretty green. And so Jo was pretty satisfied with that, but Wout wasn't. And... We kind of decided, let's paint our house blue, then we at least have something for each. And So we painted our house blue, and now the whole family, we had a, a small, happy family here. Um, the kids were um, okay, and if you have two young boys like that, it's always good to keep them good, at least, otherwise you get a lot of trouble. <laughs> so we had a blue house now, um, and a little bit later, a neighbor, I mean, not a close, a little bit further down the street, he painted the house blue also. And it was a little bit more blue than ours, so it was kind of a deeper blue. But okay, that happens. The winters are tough here, people are not painting here in wintertime. And so the next year, some other people started painting their house blue in our neighborhood. <laughs> All right. and there's actually, people can be sometimes so small, there's, uh, people started bickering about, oh, my house is bluer than yours, and oh, oh. <laughs> And so our uh, home, Homeowners Association basically said we need to get rid of this uh, infight here, so let's develop a measurement so that people can make a separation between the blueness of their house. So now, um, in our neighborhoods, we developed a, a blueness scale, and we call it blue units. Um, <laughs> since we are in the U.S., uh, we actually call it international blue units. <laughs> In short, IBU. <laughs> so, people started painting their houses blue and blue, and uh, at least we had a measurement so they didn't have to fight anymore. But then it happens that Wout, uh, the guy who likes the blue, is like at a certain point, it's probably he was triggered by a trip to Belgium where most houses are in brick and a blue house is really exceptional. Um, and he was like, I don't want this house to be blue because in Belgium there's like no blue houses and blah, blah, blah. I'm like, okay, maybe we should reconsider painting our house. But then, you know what happened? The homeowner association came out and they're like, hey, we want to have a certain standard in our neighborhood and all houses need to be above 40 IBUs. <laughs> what the heck did we start here? And where do we go? And can you imagine, because I, where it started for us, I, I told you it's about 
just trying to create a harmony in the family, and then you get suddenly stuck with 40 IBUs. That's to me like, um, hey, it's a knowledge factor. You can, I, I can paint it bluer than 40 IBUs, but it's not what we want. It's not beauty for us. And this is a key thing. It's not beauty for us, and now the homeowners association want to do that. Let's go a little bit further on this. Um, I'm going to go to uh, an architect in Brussels, Victor Horta. Um, and Charlie, I'm going to put you on the spot here. What style is this? <laughs> to me, I was really searching for a picture of his work in a very detailed level, because on a detailed level, you could describe it in IBUs or in malt or in water or maybe some off flavors like the acetyl or something. Or, um, but if you look to a broader step, and if you go to the next slide, if you go a little bit to his work in a broader step, it, it's not about the details, it's about the total integration of something. It's about the beauty of the piece. And Charlie would say, well, this curliness needs to look organic, and then the curve needs to increase with one degree at every centimeter, and if you're not following that, you're out of style, you're out. <laughs> But he didn't see the picture. He didn't see the rest. He didn't see the whole. And I think this is the most important. If you design a beer, it's about seeing the whole. To me. It's not about, I'm going to refuse to read any style guidelines if I have to design a beer. Just because I think you need to keep your mind open at the moment you're designing. And you need not to focus on... I know um, it's a few years back that I was in standing in Sierra on uh, the... Up here, I was like, I'm halfway. Half of my beers are never going to win in the GABF. And I really meant that in the sense I'm trying to create um, and make beer, make a piece of beauty and nothing else. And then it's up to Charlie to come back and he creates then a style. And then, swine up flash, I went again a model, a model in the GABF. I'm going to take over. Um, I went again a, a, a medal in the GAP because the style that he just created actually now fits my beer. <laughs> Charlie, I promised to pick on you. Huh? So that's what I'm doing. Um, maybe, do I have a slide on this? Oh, yeah. All right. I'm just going to play around here for the first time. Three ingredients, experience, knowledge, and creativity. Like if you go back to this slide here from uh, Victor Horta, to me, I would probably describe that as, let's say, 50% knowledge, 30% experience, and 20% creativity. I, I rate the creativity relatively low um, because I, it's what he did for a job. It was his experience, really. Um, he was very knowledgeable on what he did. But so he could have created maybe a 70% creativity beer or building in his case. And that would have been beautiful, I guess. I'm going to take one step to one of the beers I made in New Belgium. And there was a blue paddle. We have a Pilsner. And it was the beer that I was boxed in the most uh, whenever I started designing it. People were like, oh, we want a Pilsner. And we don't want a Belgian Pilsner because that's Jupiler and Stella Artois. That's not that interesting. We want something that is more from northern Germany or maybe Bohemian. So I really could have looked to the style guidelines and say, oh, here I have it. Just create it. Or I could go to Munich, to the brewery school in Weinstefan. And if you graduate there, you can make a perfect Pilsner. I'm Belgian. I didn't want to do this. I want to... Uh, but it's key to what I... I think those style guidelines that were created around Pilsners, who are so tightly defined, were defined at a certain moment in time and at a certain brewery, uh, for a certain brewery equipment. I was working in Belgium. We were an ale brewery. I, didn't, I couldn't cool my work down to lager temperatures. So now they wanted to have a Pilsner. And so 
I focused a lot on pH and from the get-go I said I'm going to go with very hard water. Yeah, normally if you read anything about Pilsners they say, well, it, you need to start with soft water. I didn't think it was true. Not in my case because I have a different setup. And that's what I really mean. If, if you look to style, I don't know if it's in the style guidelines that it should be with soft water, maybe not. But anyway, it, didn't, it wasn't really what I wanted to do. I wanted to start with hard water because I thought I could create a beautiful Pilsner with hard water. And I went for it. There's another element there because they wanted to create a, they wanted me to create um, a beer that was relatively high in IBU. And as Belgians, we don't go so high in IBU. I did exactly what those blue houses could do for you. If you look to a blue house in the sunny side or in the shade side, it's a different shade of blue. And you can do that with IBUs also. I, um, I need to pay attention on my word choice here. Um, if you look to style guidelines and IBUs are in there, I think that's ridiculous in my eyes. In the sense that this is a measurement, a measurement that is not relating to taste. I can make you a 40 IBU beer tasting like 25. So why is it relevant, Eden? Why is it relevant? And that's why I'm having those difficulties with boxing something in. I'm going to say, if you like it, um, well, it is a 35 IBU, although it measures 25. It doesn't matter. And I did actually the lapel exactly the same. Due to playing with the pH in the beginning of boil, keeping it low, around 5.0, I created a 32, 33 IBU beer, um, but it tastes like a 25. So what? What are style guidelines? Where do I want to go with this? Um, I'm jumping here from my history to Blue Houses over Victor Horta to Blue Paddle. Um, what I really want to do is stimulate thinking. I really don't know what's... Oh, oh I should wait with this one. To me, my problem with style guidelines is the, they narrow the mind at the moment of the start of a development. And so that's why I never read them up front, because I don't want, I'm going to check afterward maybe if it fits this, the style. But I don't want to, if you are in the designing, we're, we're in the entertainment industry, we're making beer for our friends and ourselves, so well, we need to drink it. So if it fits, um, style or not, it doesn't really matter if you like it, that's all it, what it matters about. And so I really was um, wondering why don't we have style that maybe would fit a glass like this, you maybe you're not going to see this, but it's pretty wide glass, not very deep, and why don't we have a contest or maybe a style of beer to fit this glass? I know that everybody will develop a different beer here for this glass, but at least it will stimulate thought. You're going to be like, oh no, I had a dark, heavy hot beer in here and my reasons for developing were those, or I had something completely different and my reasons of thinking are those. And I, that's really the broadening the mind part. Um, shouldn't limit it in uh, front. Why, what about brewing f for a uh, uh, 4th of July style? or a wedding style, or um, a bird style, or whatever. Yeah, trying to, if it's a wedding, why don't you try to match it with a couple that's getting married? It's going to be different if I'm creating it, or if somebody from you created it, but you, there will be thought behind it why you created this beer in this direction. And that's the beauty about it, and it stimulates thought again. And a few other places, uh, you can have a good place in mind, um, and you just want to create a beer for that place. Why don't we have a style that's um, a Yellowstone style? Wow, you guys are silent. <laughs> <laughs> fell asleep. Um, I also, um, what about the low carbon footprint beer? Who can make the low, lowest carbon footprint beer? For a home brewer, that's a tough one. But it's going to stimulate thinking. And I also had some suggestions here for um, Charlie for style category 105. It's, I just kind of hit upon it accidentally. I was playing with microorganisms and um, 
different microorganisms in a, in a mixed fermentation. And the beer that I got from it, actually, it was layered. And if you poured it out, it layered again. But it was a black and tan, but it was a natural black and tan. It just was um, built in. So why don't we have 100 and, uh, style category 105, layered beer. Category A, horizontally layered. <laughs> category B, vertically layered. <laughs> category C, all <other> variations. <laughs> So what do we do with this? Um, where do we go with this as home brewers? Think, thinking back on 90, when I was working at Rodenbach, when you saw that um, Americans coming in not liking Rodenbach and how that evolved over time, I think we've come a long way. And in a big part, thanks to Charlie also, because he stimulated thought. Although I'm crushing him now, but... It's, it has been a movement that has been homegrown, and we've went very far in the U.S. I, um, sorry, I need to go back to my notes here. Um, and we educated ourselves. I really think we educated ourselves. The beers that you currently can taste on a conference like this, compared to a conference 15 years ago. I also... Um, word choice again, dare is not the right word, but maybe we have, or we we have mastered a lot of old world styles here. I think I have Odell's IPA here. I think this is way better than ever any English IPA I ever tasted. I think we need to push boundaries from here on out. We're in the right moment in time because we've done the two previous ones. We should start pushing about widening our... That's why I kind of use those examples about glasses and about low carbon footprint or about the place just because I want to stimulate thought. We, I think we, this... It's a prime ground here in the U.S. currently. We can make whatever. But I want to go back to my blue houses uh, and it's... Um, you can taste a lot of things here. Um, people are pushing in different uh, uh, directions. High bitterness, high alcohol, um, high single factor. For me, the knowledge factor. It's, they all go, always go in one direction, but they don't add something on maybe experimentation they do. But what about the creativity? If you create something high IBU, why don't you build it like Victor Horta did? Why don't you build your whole beer around those IBUs and don't let it stand alone on its own. Um, it's, for me, it's about beauty, I call it. Um, our house, we thought it was beautiful when it was blue, but then with all the blue in the neighborhood, it's not that beautiful anymore. And so it's also not about the color alone. It's always about a holistic approach. And we need to always take a step back, but I think Charlie did that already uh, in, when he introduced me. It's only about 10 minutes of pleasure. Yeah? We should never should forget that uh, what we're creating, we don't need to uh, do too much puha around it. It's just 10 minutes of pleasure. Thanks. Well, thanks to Peter Bruchart, uh, Gary Glass, and the American Homebrewers Association for giving me permission to record the, uh, the whole keynote address. And uh, I promise next year, if I have the opportunity, it will sound better. <laughs> uh, either that or I'll supply a kazoo to the, uh, the person giving the speech so it will match this year's quality. <clears throat> In a, a couple of weeks, we'll be uh, running more interviews and content from the NHC, uh, much better quality. And, uh, you know, the, around our trip to uh, Colorado, more stuff. But, uh, you know, next week we'll be celebrating our 100th episode with some groundbreaking stuff. If all goes well, knock wood. Um, if you have brewing questions, show suggestions, or just want to say howdy, write to james at basicbrewing.com or just fill out the contact form on basicbrewing.com. And please don't forget to tell us where you're from. And while you're on our site... 
You can check out our online shop where you can find great pricing on our DVDs and a combo deal to save you even more if you buy them both together. In uh, Basic Brewing Introduction to Extract Home Brewing, we walk you through the extract brewing process step-by-step from boiling to bottling. And in Basic Brewing Stepping into All Grain, we take you through the all grain process from milling your grain to collecting your wort. It's easy once you know how and fun, too. Uh, You can see a listing of the fine folks across the country who sell our DVDs on basicbrewing.com. And if there isn't a vendor in your area, you can order it online. And I'll pack it up myself. Or if I'm out of town, my wife will do it. Uh, Shirt sales are brisk. Lots of you are uh, augmenting your wardrobe with uh, basic brewing apparel, including our Go Forth and Flocculate shirts. We appreciate that. And thanks to everybody who's continued to click on our... uh, Or click... You can clink on it if you want to, but clicking is more, you know, useful. Uh, our Amazon.com link. We appreciate the support there. And uh, now, you know, this is starting to get serious with the Amazon.com link. Some of you are dropping some serious cash, and uh, we appreciate that. Our featured products this week that were purchased through the link are 14 karat white gold genuine pear, ruby, and diamond earrings. And a uh, 15-amp benchtop 10-inch table saw with fixed stand and storage shelf. <clears throat> wow. Thanks again, everybody. And remember, uh, I can't tell who bought what, so no worries there. Just click on the Amazon.com logo on our site the next time you feel like Amazon shopping, and we appreciate your support. Hope you're not... You know, just go, just going to Amazon and buying big fancy stuff to, you know, just to support us. But if you're going to go to Amazon and shop, you know, click on that little logo on our site before you go. Appreciate that. Well, that's all until next month. D- until No, not until next month. Well, yeah, until next month. But that's also next week. Till then, see, I'm a little out of practice. It's been a while. Rusty. Until then, thanks for listening. I'm James Spencer, production help for Basic Brewing Radio, and our website is provided by our buddy Kelly Dotson in Austin, who also designed our logo. Basic Brewing Radio is a production of Active Voicing. We'll talk to you next time, everybody. So long. So long.